Thank you, everybody. Okay, so happy towel day. Some people didn't know what that was uh, until they got here, but this is a big thing in the sci-fi world, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and I'm going to be interjecting that a little bit because it happened to be on that day here. Uh, Jeff said, first, we are all fallible humans, and that's only true unless there's somebody like Ford Prefect here who's actually an alien researching the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, right? He's the main character of the, the story. So... Something like having an alien among us would only be possible, of course, if there were extraterrestrial civilizations in the first place, right? So uh, how many people here believe, in fact, that, I'll start with that, UFOs may represent alien spacecraft? Do I have nobody, really? If they're UFOs, they're unidentified. Uh, but I'm asking you if those things that people report at any time, do you think they could be alien spacecraft? That's what I'm asking people. <laughs> All right, I only have five seconds here. All right, no. All right. Nobody wants to be, yeah. all right, so most people would say yes to that, in fact, I'll show you the statistics later, maybe not this crowd. But also for aliens, those to be alien spacecraft, that means alien civilizations have to exist. But come on, he gets to see an alien spaceship, how come I don't get to see one? And that's from a book, and if you know what it is later, you get extra points. So this is actually what the subject of this talk is about. Okay, so this is something that even skeptics and scientists say, and you'll see some examples of that. And I'm going to dispute that claim here. This is a, a quote I really love. Two possibilities exist. Either we're alone in the universe or we're not. Both are equally terrifying. Five seconds, anyone know it? No, all right. No, Arthur C. Clarke. Okay, so some examples, of course, of aliens. <laughs> this is an article I actually wrote, and that's the image that the publisher found to publish it. It was, how likely is the evolution of advanced aliens really? Right? So this was part of my article. Uh, extraterrestrial civilizations exist all the way, everywhere in fiction, the United Federation of Planets, Star Wars, the DC heroes, Marvel Cinematic Universe. Thanos thought the universe was so full of people he had to snap half of them away. Right? And of course you get those guys who are going to make the hyperspace bypass and destroy the Earth, the Vogons. The president of the Federation, one of the other alien creatures out there, of course, and these guys are people who know what they are. I think you had those in your presentation, and that's what they really are, interdimensional beings. Of course, there's other, there's other aliens and all sorts of things, and the best aliens in Star Trek, especially the guys on the right, <laughs> clearly not wearing makeup. So the, the issue is, is there justification to believe that anything resembling our fiction is likely mirrored somewhere in reality in our galaxy? Let's stick it to our galaxy. What is faith? It is belief in the absence of evidence. Now, I don't propose to tell anybody what to believe, but for me, believing when there's no compelling evidence is a mistake. The idea is to hold belief until there is compelling evidence. So I don't know if Carl was talking about that specific subject, but that was used in a YouTube video discussing what I'm talking about here, and it should apply to it, right? Now, in this talk, rather than talking about whether UFOs are likely to be extraterrestrial civilization, uh, spacecraft, I'm going to be asking, do extraterrestrial civilizations exist? Because if they don't exist, then UFOs are not alien, right? right. And I'm not going to, I'm going to ignore the other claims, and these are real, where people say, well, if they're not alien, they are from another dimension or the hollow earth or something like that. I'm not even going to talk about that, right? I'm also going to, just for the sake of today, grant abiogenesis is easy and likely happened on every planet where there's water and a possible reasonable temperature. That might not be true either, people. Be dispute, people dispute that, but I'm not going to even go down that path. So, one interesting point is people didn't always believe that UFOs were alien. When they first started to see them, after Kenneth Arnold reported it in 1947, and it went public, and it was written up in a paper like a saucer it would skip across the water, and therefore the name Flying Saucer came up. He didn't say that, right? Right after that, Gallup did a poll, and already almost all Americans had heard this. And therefore, what happens? Everyone else was seeing flying saucers. Duh. Right? So there was a historian of the, uh, who wrote about this, uh, and he said that people of that time did not think about aliens. They, they realized that they were just unrecognized aircraft or things like that. So they certainly believe differently now. 2021 poll, most recent one I could easily find, 65% of Americans believe in extraterrestrials, and that means somewhere. And 51% believe UFOs are probably their spaceships, right? Now, flying saucers came to be seen as a silly, silly term. No one should say flying saucer. So what happened, NASA did a rebranding and called them 
unidentified anomalous phenomena, mm -hmm. right? So that makes it sound not silly anymore. But believe it or not, anyone who believes in these things believes those are their spacecraft, whatever you call it. And this is, you know, re representing that. People want to believe this for whatever reason that is. Mm -hmm. And as I said, many well-known scientists and skeptics contribute to this by claiming that alien civilizations are likely, they use the word probable, and um, some even claim that UFOs are alien, the first question I asked you. An example is this quote is a game changer. We now have to basically say the military have to prove they aren't extraterrestrial. So who said that? Anybody know? Uh, theoretical physicist, Misha Kaku, all over the news this last two years, right? So whenever the topic of alien comes up, you're likely to hear people, including scientists and skeptics, say that they are likely, and it's partly because of the exoplanet thing, right? The last 10 years, we've discovered almost all stars have planets, and a lot of them, right? So the other idea is the mediocrity principle, the argument against hubris, right? We, we can't be special. The solar system is just like every other solar system, and life on Earth just is going to happen, right? No, no issues there at all. So I want to show you... This. A lot of prominent scientists and skeptics believe this stuff. And I'll, I'll talk about a few of them here, but it's a much longer list than this. Yeah, and here's the list. That was Jay Diamond talking at Susan's group six years ago or more. Yeah, yeah. And, and he talked a little bit about the subject. He called them LGMs, which is little green men. He didn't get <laughs> it to civilizations. But here's a, mere, a more famous person than Jay Diamond. Do you think? that there is life outside of Earth, intelligent life in the universe? Absolutely, there is life elsewhere, and almost certainly intelligent life. It has to be. The odds are just overwhelming. There's 200 billion stars in this galaxy. Well, now it looks like every star has about 10 planets, so there's almost certainly intelligent life. Almost certainly, and meaning civilizations, too. All right. Now, the UFO movie they don't want you to see, which is where I got the title of my thing, right? Uh, has a really great scientific investigation of the claims that, that UFOs are alien and totally trashes that. And I love that approach he took because he started at the beginning by a give me, and this is what he said. In fact, we figure there are tens of billions of planets, and that's just right here in our local galaxy. That's more planets than there are people on Earth. Billions more. On all those planets, are there any civilizations right now. Now, I don't know what your map tells you, but my map says there are probably many out there right now. Yeah, so that quote was that, and I don't know where he gets that math. All right, because we're going to go through a little bit of that. Uh, that opinion is, in fact, shared by many for the reasons I told you, so that wasn't unusual. And I actually, I'm not too upset that he did that at the beginning of the film because he wanted people who absolutely believe that UFOs are alien or here among us and you might be a lizard person right now. He didn't want to turn them off as the very first thing he would say, no, there's no, alien, there's no aliens on any planets at all. So, okay, I didn't have too much of a problem with that for that reason. Um, so, also doing this, let the film end on an optimistic note regarding the search for extraterrestrial life via radio waves. We don't have the power to break the laws of physics but we do have the power to keep our porch light on and our welcome mat spread out. So keep listening, keep sending, keep hoping, and keep watching. If we can do that, our chances of eventually becoming part of an interstellar community of some kind are fair. Friends we haven't met yet are probably out there. Some might well have their eye on us. It might be 10,000 years from now, or it might be tomorrow. But that signal full of data could come any time. I'm Brian Dunnett. Thank you for watching. So despite me disagreeing with that, I highly suggest you watch that film for free on YouTube. So the question here, is such optimism justified? So now we have to talk about the Fermi paradox and the Drake equation. I'm sorry, but that has to come up in this topic of conversation, right? Oh, another quote I like. The universe is a pretty big place. If it's just us, it seems like a waste to say. Who said that? No, Carl Sagan, contact. <laughs> Repeated in the movie. So, 
current, a current series on Netflix, fantastic science fiction if you haven't watched it. The Chinese here in the 60s are trying to communicate with extraterrestrials by beaming them a powerful signal. Yoji 可是这些外星人都在哪儿呢？也许根本就没有外星人。Okay, but that's not typically believed. All right, some scientists have argued that the unusual characteristics of Earth and where it is in space were instrumental in development of life here, and conditions like this may not be typical for other planets. Right? In fact, they argue that the set of uh, uh, environments here is very advantageous circumstances, and it might be extremely rare. So let, there was one scientific paper I dug up easily um, called Dissolving the Fermi Paradox, and they, they told you what the Fermi Paradox was. Again, life should be all over the place. How come we can't contact anybody? And they say about the, the pieces of the Drake equation should show you, if you believe this thing, a large number of potentially observable situations. And this is, sorry, the Drake equation. A bunch of terms which have to do with figuring out how many civilizations could be in there. Right, and the, we'll, we'll talk about our galaxy for one. So there's three, th three of those variables I will be discussing here a little bit. On how many planets would intelligent life emerge, what the ratio is. Also, once intelligent life emerges, you know, how, how does it become a civilization? And then also how long the civilization lasts. So this is from that paper again. They say that when the models recast to represent realistic distribution of the variables, Substantial probability of there being no other intelligent life in the observable universe. So that's a different type of math, right? So the belief that alien civilizations are very likely or probable, to me, seems very, very overly optimistic. And of course, if there's no such civilizations, then the UFOs that are being spotted are not their spacecraft because there's nobody there. This is all captured in a thing called Rare Earth Hypothesis, Wikipedia article, of course, oh, which, wow. which we didn't write. <laughs> so. Um, and I'm going to go through some of the details in the Earth Hypothesis, all right? The necessary conditions to produce a life on a planet may include possibly all, but at least some of these things. A favorable location in its galaxy, not too close to the dangerous galactic core and other stars that might cause, you know, interruption in the planet's life-bearing capability. A stable orbit around the star and a long-lived star and not tidally locked. Fable arrangement of other planets, because we already know planets get shot out of, of systems when other planets come too close to them, and that happened in our early solar system. Uh, the planet has to be big enough to hold on to an atmosphere. Mars wasn't, right? It has to have a stable atmosphere that can't swing from all oxygen to no oxygen, because the life would have been killed off, and that sort of happened on Earth. I'll get to that. A strong enough a magnetic field to protect emergent life from cosmic radiation, which is always deadly. And we just found this out about Venus and Mars. There's something that has gone on in that dissociative recombination, which destroys any water that fell on the planet and turns it into something else so there's no water left. That would be very bad on Earth. So any planet lucky enough to get all of those right, like Earth did, right, then has to have other things happen. A reasonably stable climate with, that doesn't swing drastically between droughts and glaciers. And think three-body problem for people who have seen that show about this other civilization that struggled to come to existence on a planet where it got burned and, and, and then drenched and burned and frozen. So not too large of a planet. I found this out from the Skeptic's Guide to the Future book. And they did the analysis and showed if the Earth was only 50% larger in diameter, you couldn't launch into space with a rocket. So wow, that's, that's amazing. You have to have habitable dry land, because I'm sorry, if you're an intelligent species and develop only underwater, like you're not going to make electricity, never mind computers or, or rocket ships. Therefore, you would have no spacecraft, uh, unless. <laughs> so now let's talk biology. Right. In my AP, IAPTI article that I, that I showed you, I said, well, what if the clock was turned back and Earth really was here, fine, 
but something biological happened different. Would there be a species on this planet who could have a civilization? Numerous evolutionary steps led to our species. Self-replicating molecules had formed and thrived. Then single cell life emerged and had to thrive and survive an atmospheric change, which I'll talk about in a minute. Then complex single cell life had to emerge, multicellular life emerged, complex life forms. Life found a way on land, because I said if they were just dolphins, sorry, they wouldn't be getting into space. Um, primates emerged and became bipedal and intelligent. The bipedal is important because they needed their forward limbs to do stuff, stuff, right, with technology. So a long chain of events on Earth led to five billion species developing on our planets. All had to struggle against the elements and each other for competition. And of all the, life took a billion years to get started. For most of the time, it was single cell life. Three billion years of the time Earth's been here, it took for bacteria to evolve. And then another half billion for something with a, a spine to evolve. And in total, four and a half billion years for humans and their civilization on this planet. Well, okay, how much of time is, this is representing where we are from now, going clockwise around. The tiny, tiny, tiny sliver is the only civilization we know about ours. And that's the time it took to develop it on our planet, the last tiny second. And if you look at that as a calendar, that's a month in, in, in length, this is, how you would have to get to that fact of how short of a time there's been a civilization on this planet. Right now they're gonna blow out the last four days and show you what happened, you know, all, all of the stuff that we can really investigate. Aquatic life, first cells, forests, mammals, and we're this tiny little sliver at the bottom with the civilization, the only one we know about again. And Earth will be unlivable in 1.3 more billion years. So for 75% of the time, 77% of the time, it took to develop a civilization on this planet. There's, there's very little time left. And the question is, will our civilization survive for those billions of years? Unlikely, I think. But in any case, that's the L in the Drake equation, which we don't really have an eye because there's no sample data, right? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about life's unending struggle for survival that we've gone through on this planet once it even gets started. Early in life's history, two billion years ago, extensive mass extinction of, of all pre-multicellular life. Right, that was the oxidation event. I, I told you that the atmosphere changed from one type to the other, and it killed almost everything that was, had evolved to live in the other conditions. So basically, life had to start again. 99%, I think it's actually 99.9% .9 of Earth's five billion species are extinct. And following the great oxidation event, there were five more mass extinctions. And actually, there were a lot of little gradual extinctions, but we have names for the five big ones. 445 million years ago, 85% of all species wiped out. 372 million years ago, 70% of all the species left, then wiped out. 252, the Triassic, 70% and 81% of marine. This is a uh, Triassic Jurassic 200 million years ago, again, up to 75%. This actually left room for the dinosaurs and mammals. If any, yeah. Then the one that people mostly know about, the KT extinction, 66 million years ago. There's a movie with that name, 66, um, about this. The extinction event killed off 75% of species. So closer in time to us, much, due to an ice age, I just learned about this recently, which froze the northern hemisphere. It changed the, the climate in Africa, and it made our monkey, prime, uh, our monkey relatives come down from the trees and essentially were forced to work to walk upright. So if that glaciation hadn't happened at that time, then you wouldn't get, you know. Of course, there's another possible explanation for the intelligence on the planet. So much later, there was evidence of a human bottleneck. So even we survived all of that and arose and evolved, we were almost wiped out 70,000 years ago because there were only 10,000 of us left. So one tiny little climate change, a drought in a local area in Africa, and we would not be here talking to each other. So, and just graphically, we have the order of primates and the gorilla, a great apes has taken over to the right. So if that little uh, thing hadn't happened, no humans, it would only be. Oh. And you know, and going further, you know, all the way down, eh, there would be no apes if that change hadn't happened, if that branch hadn't happened, you wouldn't have, and, and it just goes on and on. You go all the way down. Any little change, in other words, you would not have humans, you would not have an intelligent species on this planet, and no civilization. So collectively, those impediments are called the great filters. This is something in addition to the rare earth hypothesis, right? And that's another Wikipedia page. It basically talks about all the things that life had to do on this planet to successfully make a civilization. 
And this is a great, great documentary. I just finished this last month, Life on Our Planet, narrated by Morgan Freeman. It was released not too long ago. And it doesn't talk about rare earth hypothesis or the filters directly, but you can get all that information from watching this. And it is quite informative. Of, it shows it how difficult the struggle for life has been. So since our lineage survived all the gray filters of the past, it may seem like we're home free, but of course not. This gray filters in our future. We must survive a climate crisis everyone talks about, a threatening pandemic that might be worse than COVID. What if Ebola goes you know, airborne? Civilization ending warfare, this is all uplifting topics here. I know, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, and uh, death from the sky global extinction event, which has happened at least once on this planet, and this shows a scenario for it to happen now. So the topic I've discussed here is also discussed in a lot of books. This is one I like, Alone in the Universe, Why Our Planet is Unique from 2011. I really like that one. And uh, you can search the YouTubes all over the place. Could we belong to this one? Where, where are the aliens? This guy does the math, and it is astounding uh, in a, a TED Talk. Uh, that was Jay Diamond from the Monterey County Scout. It, it's just all over the place. I just got a few sites. So, this is how I sort of ended my uh, article in AIPT Science. Enjoy those tales of cosmic encounters, galactic empires, and I'll add today the Vogron construction fleet demolishing Earth to make way for the hyperbase space bypass, because those are probably the only aliens that humans are going to ever meet or, or see, right? So I'm going to give Brian one more little clip here, because he had some words of moderation to what he said in the UFO movie they don't want you to see when he was on The Thinking Atheist just last week. <laughs> You can talk to a million astronomers and you'll get a million different answers on how much life they think there is in the universe and whether any of it is intelligent. Uh, you'll get anything from there's probably very little life out there and probably none of it is intelligent to there's probably intelligent civilizations everywhere uh, and, and everything in between. But these are all just guesses because we don't have the data yet. Thank you. Right. And I'm getting the very final last word. You don't even have to talk about Cox, this is the last thing. Uh, the last word to Brian Cox, who will be a featured speaker at SciCon 2024. I am. He, he's the Neil deGrasse Tyson of the UK, if people don't know who he is. And uh, yeah, here's him talking about the subject. One of the problems we face as a civilization is we don't know how valuable we are. In our galaxy, the Milky Way, there are 400 billion stars and countless trillions of planets. And yet, it is possible that you could count the number of civilizations on the fingers of one hand. In fact, it's possible that there is only one, and that's us here. So thank you very much for your attention.